Good morning. Good morning. I am going to use the little stool over here this morning. I know it's the opposite side of the church, so it feels a little movement this morning. And I am over here this morning because we are welcoming the Reverend Dr. Lillian Daniel to our pulpit this morning. She is our conference minister. Um, so afterwards, I hope you have a few minutes to sit with her and chat with her. Tell her what you love about the community and about the church listen to her stories as well, but it is an honor to have the Reverend Dr. Lillian Daniel with us this morning. So for those of you that are joining us from home, I hope that you are able in Facebook to put in where you are watching from so that we may know where our neighbors and friends are. I hope that you have split screen second device, otherwise printed out the bulletin so that you can follow along the order of worship this morning. I draw your attention to the announcements as they are printed in the back of the bulletin. I would like to highlight the Father Fred Shoe event, but I'm sure Beth is going to say some more about that in just a minute. And I'm taking a deep breath. This morning is the last morning that I will be here. I can do that. Okay. I'm so used to standing on the block. It's a first world issue problem with the shoes size that I wear. Um, this is the last Sunday that I will be here for the next three months. I start my sabbatical July 1st while I am at General Synod in Indianapolis. I am leaving for there uh, Thursday morning because of the drive that it takes to get there and my apprehension of finding a parking space. So I will be leaving Thursday morning. I'd like to really draw your attention to the back of the bulletin underneath the announcements where it says office hours, it says Board of Deacons. Generally, that's where you find my contact information. That's how you get a hold of your deacons. So please uh, put that up where you may need it. Give them a call if you have any problems, concerns, thoughts. Um, they are your board and they are here to help take care of you while I am gone. The beautiful thing about this church is that we look out for each other all the time. There is also, doo -doo -doo -doo. it did not get in the bulletin, and I'm sorry about that, Alec. Um, Luke, I'm looking at Alex thinking you're going to be here. Um, <laughs> the community dinner. Sarah, were you going to speak to that? Sure. Okay. There we go. The rest of the announcements. Good morning. Whoa, I just unplugged the fan. <laughs> At least I didn't trip. Um, first of all, I just want to remind people about bottles and cans. Yes, we are still collecting them. If you are on the Christian Ed team and have some time this week, we have an abundance to return. See me, and we'll schedule a time for that. I um, want to thank Linda Jenema. This past week, she took back over $60 worth, and we are grateful for that. 
There, um, the sign up for One Room Sunday School is on the bulletin board. We've only had four people sign up so far, so if you can find it in your heart, please do so. And if you need an idea of an activity or an event to um, participate in, let Carolina and my, or myself know, and we'll take care of that for you. Also, the sign up for the Father Fred um, show event is the kitchen crew and the volunteers. Um, both of those are on the bulletin board. They are separate sign-up sheets. And the kitchen crew needs to be here at 7 o'clock in the morning and will be done by 9. Last year, I think we were done by 8, but um, we're just staying till 9 o'clock. And with the volunteer sheet, you can work anywhere from... Oh, thank you. <laughs> One more thing to add. Um, anywhere from 8 in the morning till 5 at night, you can work the whole day or just part of the day. Um, we are still collecting socks for the Father Fred shoe event. Um, all those are ankle socks. And at this point, we, all, we need all sizes. So we're pretty well set, and we'll take any size that you have. This is the last month that we'll be collecting those. They are in the um, tub out in the narthex. Um, so can, Carolina just handed me this. We'll be doing a flyer for the church. Um, it is a Christian education. Um, every year we, we participate, yeah, yes. we, every year we participate in the Benzie Senior Resource Walkathon, Walk, Run, or Bike. And last year it was just Carolina and Liam because we had a memorial service here. We also have uh, Hale's memorial service that day. But we will be um, putting out a flyer and we'll be collecting pledges. Um, even though it was just the two of them last year, we raised over $400 for Benzie Senior Resources. So look forward to that. <coughs> Excuse me. And the last thing um, that we introduced these last week, these are our bags for the Father Fred Shoe event. And we did um, have uh, additional for the congregation if they'd like to purchase one. They are $10. That's what they cost us per bag. And I used mine this week for the farmer's market. And they really do wash up nice. Do not do it. They say you can use it in the machine. I would not do that. But um, they wipe down, and it looks brand new. So see me after church if you're interested in one. Thank you. So Benzie Faith in Action is still at it, and the community meals are back for the summer. Um, the first one is this coming Thursday at 6 o'clock at the Veterans Memorial Park uh, Pavilion where we had them last summer. So anyone who is available, 6 p.m., if you need a ride, um, you're welcome to speak with me and we will uh, get you down there. But the first one is this Thursday, 6 o'clock, and then there is a flyer on the bulletin board that outlines the next two, the July and the August dinner. Other announcements for the good of the community this morning. I just want to add to thank you for Kathy, to Kathy Hahn for returning bottles and cans. She just handed me some cash, so <laughs> she took some back this week also. Excellent. This draws me then to joys and concerns. Earl, you can start walking over towards them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift up two um, joys and concerns that I have this morning so far. One is that there is a new hymn in the bulletin this morning. I know how we feel about new music. We can do it. I promise. It's an easy tune. Just watch the words. It's all good. The other one is there, the humidity is building in here. So if you need to crack open a window, you need to turn the fan a little bit so that you're more comfortable, please do so um, to be comfortable. Other joys and concerns? Uh, yes, hi. Um, okay, I have a couple of, con not concerns, just sadness, I guess. I lost a sister a month ago, and then Mark lost his brother a couple weeks ago. So they're both 90, 91. And anyway, and then uh, the 14th of June, we had our 60th wedding anniversary. So that was great. And uh, on the weekend, I had uh, my nieces and nephews were all invited. We didn't know anything about it. My great-grandkids were here from California. They were 12, 8, and 6. They were here for eight days. So, yeah. And then we went and walked the Sky Bridge. We did it. I did it. And it was great. It was great. 
So we had a lot of fun. Um, Carolina and I wanted to thank everyone who attended Liam's open house last weekend. There were a lot of you who are here today were there and it was a, it was a really nice turnout and we, we definitely felt the love from our, from our church family. So thank you all very much. I just want to remind us to pray for Pat Delaney, for Ann Norbeck. And uh, for my neighbor, uh, Sandy Green, these are three people that uh, have certain problems. So, and I will remind you that there are notes to sign for the jail on the table. Thank you. I would just like to see if anybody can say some prayers for Jeff Sandman's family. He's my cousin. And... Um, got two young kids and just help everybody just praise that they can have some peace in their life this thanks actually I'm asking for prayers for wildlife because I killed a deer yesterday <laughs> And I think I totaled my car at the same time, but I feel so bad about that deer because it was a female deer. And um, it was, um, but everybody's, I was the only one in the car and I was fine, but I believe my car is totaled. It had to be towed away, but I could see, and the deer was definitely dead up in front of me and I could see it was a female deer and uh, she might have some fawns somewhere. So just prayers for wildlife. I invite you to take all of those places where we have giggled and rejoiced with celebrations and those places where we have mourned or grieve or are concerned about our neighbors and to lift them up from your heart, to hold them in a sacred place that we may offer care and mercy in God's love. Let us know that the God who dwells before us, the God that dwells among us, and the God that calls us to dwell with each other is present in this place. Let us prepare for worship. Please join me in the call to worship, the responsive reading, printed in the bulletin. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another, render judgments that are true, and make for peace. Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. 
We are all here to follow and show God's love. Here is the new hymn that I warned you of. It is inserted. I invite you to stand as you are able in body or spirit to lift your voices for that. Nina, would you play that all the way through once before we start? Join me in the gathering prayer printed in the bulletin. Eternal God, whose image lies in the heart of all people, we live among peoples whose ways are different from ours, whose faiths are foreign to us, whose tongues are unintelligible to us. Help us to remember that you love all people with your great love that all religion is an attempt to respond to you, that the yearnings of others' hearts are much like our own and are known to you. Help us to recognize you in the words of truth, the things of beauty, the actions of love about us. We pray through Christ, who is a stranger to no one land other than another, and to every land no less than to the other. seated.
Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Micah. It is the sixth chapter, verses six through eight. May we hear the words that we know so well anew. What shall I bring when I come before Yahweh and bow down before God on high, you ask? Am I to come before God with burnt offerings, with one-year-old calves? Will Yahweh be replaced by thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? Should I offer my firstborn for my wrongdoings, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Listen here, mortal. God has already made absolutely what is good, what Yahweh needs from you. Simply do justice, love kindness, and humbly walk with your God. Greetings in the name of Christ, and on behalf of the Michigan Conference, I am Lillian Daniel, your conference minister, and I moved here from Iowa with Jim Holub, who can wave to you over there. Um, we moved here almost exactly a year ago, and uh, I am based in Grand Rapids, where I accidentally bought a historic home. And this is my first trip, uh, really, to get to know Benzie County. But since arriving a year ago, I've been pretty much on the road visiting one of our UCC churches every Sunday. And so I bring you greetings in the name of Christ and from all your church family, 141 congregations right now and 350 plus clergy. It is my custom to, um, to remind you, this church in particular, of your congregational history. Those early Congregationalists um, who started in New England but came originally were dissenters um, in England itself, uh, cut the heads off one statue too many, found themselves on the run in Holland. A group of them uh, got on a little boat called the Mayflower and came to this land. And as they were leaving, uh, their pastor, John Robinson, who was not able to accompany them on the Mayflower, gave a sermon in which he said, there is yet more light and truth to break forth from God's holy word. Or in other words, God is still speaking in the scriptures. If we listen and if we have a well-educated laity and clergy. So a little Bible study before you hear the story today. The story is the story of the Good Samaritan. And even if you've never been to church before, most people, if I say a Good Samaritan, they probably know it is somebody who helps a stranger out, a good person. But the background of the story is this. The Good Samaritan is a story that Jesus tells, maybe even makes up on the spot when he's being pressed in an argument. This was what was going on at the time in the Gospel reading. You're going to hear when it's read that Jesus is debating with other Jewish people like himself, because Jesus, of course, was Jewish. This is before anybody could imagine there would be a new religion called Christianity. So Jesus is Jewish. He is teaching publicly. And other Jewish teachers and leaders are trying to figure out what kind of Jewish teacher he is. In somewhat similar way that if you were to introduce yourself to somebody and they said, I am a Christian, you might be wondering what kind. Are you UCC? Are you Presbyterian? Are you Catholic? Are you this or you that? And you might just ask or you might ask some questions about what do you believe about this, that, and the other thing. That's what's happening in this gospel reading. They say, Jesus, um, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? So they're trying to figure out what kind of Jew he is, and chances are it's going to be the wrong kind. Because this is not a friendly religious question that he's being asked. They're trying to figure out, are you one of us or some other kind? So after answering the question, they don't accept it, his answer, even though it's a very acceptable answer. He says, you know what? 
Let me just instead tell you a story. There once was a man who got robbed and was left for dead on the side of the road. And that's the story of the Good Samaritan. Second important fact. When Jesus tells this story and describes different people walking by the injured man, he's essentially describing people from their church who are walking by and not helping. When he says a Samaritan stops to help, it's a surprise in the story. Because this is an important piece of historical background. The Samaritans were the enemies of the Jewish people. They had generations of conflict. They did not trust one another at all. So if you were Jewish and you were injured on the side of the road and a Samaritan walked toward you, you would not be relieved. You would be fearful. So, as you prepare to hear this reading, I want you to consider, is there a group of people like that for you? Who would the Samaritans be? Like if I told you, you don't have to admit it out loud or say it to anybody. Is there a group of people you just worry about? You think probably wouldn't help you. In fact, might even make things worse. Now you all are looking at me as though you've never had a stereotypical thought in your lives and that this is spiritually beneath you, so just play with me here. But imagine the least likely person to help in your mind and then hear the story with the same ears that the people would have heard it when Jesus told it. Because friends, you could have done anything else with your time today. Instead, you are being countercultural, worshiping something other than yourselves, engaging in an ancient text. So whatever could prevent you from being here today, lay all that on the everlasting arms of Jesus, breathe deeply, and open your hearts and minds to God's holy scripture. From the common English Bible, Luke verses, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Again, let us listen anew to the stories that we know. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, you must love God with all of your heart, with all of your being, all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And you must love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right, so he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest who was going down the same road when he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by that spot, saw the injured man, and crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan who was on a journey came to where the man was, but when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. And then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. And when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered the thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy towards him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. 
May we be blessed by the reading, hearing, and understanding of the words given to us. Amen. So my Aunt Gloria and my Uncle John, who are from Anderson, South Carolina, which is my hometown, were going to a fancy event, and they were driving there, and it was in the neighboring city of Greenville, South Carolina, about half an hour away. And it was a dressy event. And my Aunt Gloria loved to shop for a dressy outfit. She would go to TJ Maxx or somewhere like that, and she would find the most elegant thing on sale, and then she would glitz it up with some sparkly earrings and whatnot, and she would look like a million dollars. She loved to shop for things like that. My Uncle John, on the other hand, did not like to shop, did not like to spend money, on absolutely anything, especially gas. Uncle John was of the opinion, and he claimed that he learned this as part of his training as an engineer. He was of the opinion that cars indeed can run on fumes, but only if you give them the opportunity. So the idea was you must let the car tank get down to empty, and then the fumes will kick into action, and the car will go for a mile or two, and you will get this savings. But the only way to realize the savings that Uncle John believed in was to let the car get to empty. And so Uncle John believed you should never put more than $5 of gas in the car at a time. Well, sure enough, they're driving to this dressy event, Aunt Gloria is all dressed up, and the car rolls to a stop. Oh, to have been a fly on the wall and overheard the tender words exchanged by the long married couple on this occasion. But once they got through that, once they got over that, they had to figure out what to do with themselves. They were broken down and stuck on the side of the road. At first, they thought, well, we just get out of the car, we flag for help. But then as they thought about it, they said, these people driving by are strangers. They might want to rob us. Aunt Gloria was wearing very sparkly things. Aunt Gloria was so sparkly that she even one night ordered from late night television a little device called a bedazzler that you could add more sparkles to your clothing. And she said, people are going to see me all sparkly, and they're going to try to rob us. They're going to think we're rich. Then they said, maybe we lock ourselves in the car. No, they said, don't do that because people could still see the sparkles and so they might break into the car. Eventually, and it was amazing to the family, Uncle John and Aunt Gloria made the baffling decision that rather than accept the help of a stranger on the road, they would literally climb into a ditch on the side of the road and cover themselves. Hold on. Don't worry. <laughs> they made the decision that rather than accept help from a stranger on the side of the road, they would literally climb in the ditch on the side of the road. And they climbed in the ditch and they covered themselves in kudzu. Do you know what kudzu is? It is a creepy, invasive plant that grows on the side of highways. And they cover themselves in kudzu and dirt, and they spent the night there. Until the next morning, sure enough, one of their neighbors from their small town in Anderson drove by, recognized the car, said, oh, I believe that's John Edwards' car. I think I know what happened here. <laughs> and, he, and he goes over and he hollers for him and they crawl out of the ditch covered in dirt and leaves and they literally get rescued by their own neighbor. Now this was years before cell phones and all those options so when they got back and told the family this story of course we were all horrified that they had spent the night on the side of the road. But none of us could agree what the safest course of action might have been instead. We understood the fear of what could happen at the hands of a stranger. In the end, the only thing the family could agree about 
was that we said, what kind of a terrible world do we live in when good people like Aunt Gloria and Uncle John would rather sleep on the side of the road in the dirt than accept help from a stranger? What kind of world do we live in? We live in exactly that kind of world today, and it's actually exactly the same world that Jesus lived in. That there has always in life been a tension between accepting help from a stranger and protecting yourself. When I was taught this story of the Good Samaritan when I was a child in church, the way it was taught to me was, Lillian, you want to be a Good Samaritan. You should be the person who helps other people. And I wanted to be that person. And I came out of church and I told my parents, when I grow up, I'm going to be a Good Samaritan. My father said, is that so? And my mother was more encouraging and said, oh, Lillian, you don't have to wait until you're a grown-up to be a Good Samaritan. You can be a Good Samaritan right now. You're already a Good Samaritan. We are Good Samaritans. We help the strangers. But then, in the days that followed as a child, I observed when my parents, for example, would walk by somebody on the street who was asking for money or the times when we would drive down the highway and we would see a broken down car and I'd say, I thought we were good Samaritans. Why aren't we stopping to help those people? And they said, oh, it's complicated. As I approached my teenage years, I took it upon myself to inform them of their catastrophic religious hypocrisy and uselessness as ethical human beings, already showing the signs of being a great preacher. When they said it's complicated, I thought it was nonsense. But later, it seems like just a short time later, I was the parent. And my children came home saying they wanted to be the Good Samaritan. And they wanted to pull over and help somebody in an empty van on the side of the road. And I was the one saying, it's complicated. Because at what point, as adults, do you burst that compassionate and hopeful bubble of a child? By saying, on the one hand, yes, we want to be the Good Samaritan, but on the other hand, do not speak to strangers. Do not get in a car with somebody. Do not stop in the dark on the side of the road. At a certain point, you have to have that conversation and say it's complicated. I understand why we want to be the Good Samaritan. On the one hand, we want to be generous, but if we really look at the story, the Good Samaritan is the one in the story who has all the power, if you think about it. The man in the ditch has lost everything, and people walk by. But the Good Samaritan comes by, and first, the Good Samaritan clearly has the resources and the money, if you will, to help this poor person. So it's like, I kind of want to be the Good Samaritan because I want to be in the position to help people. The Good Samaritan is sensitive culturally, understands that this man in the ditch would be frightened of him, probably. So it doesn't say, like, come on back to my house for a pizza. Instead, the, the Good Samaritan like says, I'll take you to, you know, the, the Hotel Frankfurt, and I'll give them my credit card, and I'll tell them to just pay all your bills. And then I'm even going to circle back in a day or so and find out if there's any other bills that need to be covered. You know, did, I mean, this poor man, he was beaten and on the side of the road, he's going to break into the minibar. The Good Samaritan just gets it right. Of course we want to be the Good Samaritan. Not only did I study this story, 
as a child in church, but then as an adult, and then I went to divinity school, and then I got a doctorate, and I was a religion major. I feel like I've had like 17 years of schooling in religion, and every time I heard this story, the ethical conversation was about being the Good Samaritan, and when you could, and when you might not be. And 17 years, nobody suggested the possibility to me that what this story was about was being in the ditch. That didn't occur to me until I grew up, experienced some of life, and found myself in the ditch. Because, you know, you can't, you can't get many years on this earth and not at some point end up in a ditch. You could be in a ditch like this poor man in the story who has been robbed and attacked and left for dead. We're not told any reason. You notice also, by the way, that Jesus doesn't even get into any blaming and shaming like we might do today. Today, if you heard this story, you know, it's scary to be in the ditch. We want to distance ourselves. So we'd be like, well, why did he end up in the ditch? Oh, he was robbed. Well, well, what was he doing? Was he flashing money around? Was he wearing sparkly clothes that had been bedazzled? Was he doing something stupid? No, they just say he was in the ditch. And in life, there are points at which you find yourself in the ditch, and you're in need of help, and it's a terrible place to be. And we get pushed in the ditch, illness makes us fall in the ditch, an accident happens, and sometimes, let's be honest, it's a ditch of our own making, where we make some foolish mistake or some terrible choice, and we end up in the ditch. And when that happens to you, you just want to get out of the ditch as quickly as you can, right? You scramble out of the ditch, and usually you can do something to get out of it. But you look around, and you think, I hope nobody saw me in that ditch. And you brush yourself off, and you say, that's a distant memory. But as life goes on, sometimes you'll have these times in your life where you'd get knocked in the ditch one time, two times, three times. And it's like you can't get out. And you get so used to living in the ditch that the next time you go in, you just bring the shovel with you to dig it deeper. That's what happened to me in my midlife vocational crisis, personal vocation, everything. I was in the ditch and couldn't get out. Felt like I lost everything. My career, my job, which in my case meant a vocation, my purpose in life, my family unraveled. I lost my parents. I was divorced. Even my own children rejected and abandoned me. Now, to be fair, they called it graduation. <laughs> but if you've ever had one of these extended periods in the ditch, you know you can get a little grandiose and dramatic also. And during that time in the ditch, though, I'd never had one quite that bad. I had the experience of the person in the story, where I watched and I saw, oh, look, here's pastor so-and-so, here's a church person, they're going to help me, and they walked by. Oh, here's this wonderful person I know from church. Oh, they said, I would help you, Lillian, but I'm going to a committee meeting of the endowment to fund the Society of the Prevention of Ditch Dwelling. Because we like to look at systemic causes of ditchiness. So I'll be back for you. You can apply for a grant. I also had the experience of the person in this story where I got close to God. I had an opportunity to really talk to the God I had been talking about as a preacher. And in that time period, I connected with the Holy Spirit in ways that you don't when you're managing your own success or even when you're helping other people. And I also had the experience of the man in the story that I had surprises of the people who did come and visit me in the ditch. It wasn't the people I expected. I had people come down, climb down there in the dirt in the ditch with me, 
and help me. And in some cases, they were people I barely knew. Or they were people who just seemed so perfect. I couldn't believe they were willing to climb in the ditch with me. I said, what are you doing here in the ditch? We barely know each other. And 201, those people who helped, they said, first, you're going to get stronger in the ditch. You're going to be different in the ditch. You are going to get out of the ditch. In fact, consider yourself to be currently enrolled in Ditch University, where apparently it looks like you're getting a PhD. But you will come out wiser because of this, closer to God, and you're going to survive it. And I said, how do you know all this? And they said, because I've been in the ditch too. Every one of them said that. And I was stunned. I said, I never thought you were so ditchy. And these people said, you know, ditch happens to us all. In many ways, the last couple years of the pandemic have been the institutional church's ditch. Now, if we're honest, churches, and I don't care what denomination you are, churches in this country were in the ditch before the pandemic hit us. We were already in the ditch. We were struggling. We were kind of scrambling around the edges there, right? Hanging on. But then the pandemic hit. And remember how sudden it all was. And all of a sudden, we were just isolated, cut off from each other. And as the church, we weren't able to do any of the things we were good at doing like gathering people to worship something other than ourselves, eating together, singing together, even learning new hymns, God help us. We couldn't do any of it. And all of a sudden, we had to make these decisions. And we were all of a sudden so isolated. And just to make it interesting, like Satan said, oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to like let everybody go into their own ditch of isolation by themselves and let everybody take their laptop and their phone with them so they can go really crazy. And we did, right? It was so hard. Whatever rabbit hole we went down, we went down it alone and with our computers and our phones. Is it any wonder that it was hard to make decisions on what to do with the church? And I know that every church looks out and says, oh, that church down the street got it right. But trust me, even the big church down the street is going to have regrets and questions about what they did. There were precautions that I, as a pastor serving a church in Iowa, I look back on it. There were precautions that I should have taken earlier, but I didn't know. And then also looking back, if I'm honest, there were precautions that we were taking that now that we look back on it, in terms of the science, it makes as much sense as wearing garlic around your neck to keep the vampires away. Like, remember when we were washing our mail and all that? Nobody had a crystal ball on this. Everybody was doing the best they could. And as that sense of isolation, that struggle of how to be the church, and it was so hard, in that ditch as an institution, and yet all in our isolated ditches, I'm going to confess, at certain points, my prayer was like, I don't know what's going to happen with any of this, and everybody is making such different decisions, and oh, Lord Jesus, my humble prayer is this. At the end of it all, just please, please, please let me be the one who was right. As we come out of this ditch, as we come out of this or wherever we are in whatever this new world is, we are different as churches because of the ditch. I know all the ways in which it is worse. And trust me, I visit churches all over Michigan. I can tell you that if you are seeing in person a third of the people that you used to see, that's about average. And if you're seeing half the people, that's great. And even the megachurches are seeing less than they did before. 
I could go on and on about the struggles and the ways in which this has been hard. I can talk about the stock market's impact, the way in which for the two years of the pandemic at the beginning, we were able financially, most of our churches to make it. And then as we're like coming out of the ditch, we get hit by this economic crisis. It's one thing after another. It's enough to make us think that the church is not the building and the money. But what was the wisdom of the ditch? This is what I'm trying to understand. What possible blessing is there in this hardship? And what I see is that a lot of our churches that didn't want to do it before had to embrace technology. And I'm grateful that people can participate online. And I know, I know the temptation that there are people who say, you know, if we just stopped doing this online, everybody would come back in person. I'm here to tell you that won't work. To not have an online presence is as crazy as locking your door on a Sunday. Because your online presence is the gateway through which people will physically enter the building again, I promise you. Nobody is coming to a church that they can't visit online five and six times first, and they're visiting several other churches as well. And by the time they tentatively put a physical foot in this building, they have been watching you. And that is a blessing. It's an opportunity to show hospitality in ways that we couldn't imagine. There's been a clarity in our churches about what was important and what was not important. If you're really honest, what were the things that you missed when you were shut down, and what were the things that you thought were essential that it turns out you could live without? I can't answer that question for this congregation, but I know the smart congregations are asking it. And if the goal is simply to return to all the activities in the same way that we did before COVID, we have missed the memo from the Holy Spirit. We have missed the learnings of Ditch University. There is a freedom in this moment to value what should be valued, worship, for example. But also to ask the question, and this is essential, every church needs to ask it, if we disappeared tomorrow, what would the community miss? Not what would you all miss. What would the people who are not a part of you miss? And these become the essential things. How do we live out the promises of worship? As for committee meetings and feuding over trivial, relatively trivial matters, turns out like we could survive not doing all that. And if we could take some of that into COVID and let what's important be important, that could be freeing too. The other amazing thing that happened in COVID was that people were able to participate with churches that they hadn't participated with before because they could digitally be in more than one place at a time. So I know that you've had people in this community who might be affiliated with another church officially, but came to be aware of what ministry you were doing and can support it. And the old categories of you're a member here but not a member there, not relevant anymore. There are multiple people with multiple connections to multiple churches, and that's not a loss, that's a potential gain. Lastly, we have an opportunity to live out the Christian virtue of humility in this moment. Whatever culture wars and struggles we had in our churches, and I had them in my church in Iowa too, whatever differences in worldview were exposed, this is now the moment to operate out of love and humility and to say words that in the rest of American culture seem to be forbidden. The, the radical statement, I could be wrong, you may be right. I didn't know. I trust you. 
if the church cannot embody these principles now and going forward, this is the last place in the community that people who are members of different political parties sit next to each other, share a meal together, talk, not with the goal of convincing each other of their rightness or wrongness or praying to Jesus, oh Lord, let me have been right, but saying, what wounds and hurts in this community are we addressing so that we would one day be known as somebody who helped those in the ditch. And whether somebody joins you as a member or not, if they participate and you're in ministry, you are the body of Christ. That was the lesson we learned. We're going to learn that we can cooperate in ways we never believed possible and that turf is not as important as we thought. We're going to learn to be of service to other in new ways. And so what I bring you is, in some ways, a piece of good news. I know that your congregation has a story to tell about what you were and what you are worried about. I'm going to tell you that compared to 141 churches in Michigan, you're doing great. You have an incredible facility. You have a wonderful pastor. You have a pastor. Because one of the struggles of COVID for the institutional church is that we have a crisis and a clergy shortage. You know how educators and healthcare workers have resigned? Double that for clergy. And so for congregations like this, I know it's hard, but you are poised and blessed with resources and strengths that so many of our churches don't have. And it's why I'm grateful for the ways in which you share what you have with the Michigan Conference so that we can be out there and helping our churches. When I was trying to find my way out of the ditch, the ditch I'd been pushed into, the ditch I'd fell into, the ditch I dug myself, at a certain point, I was coming up out of the kudzu in the dirt, and I went and talked to a conference minister like myself who's responsible for the spiritual care and oversight of the church and the clergy. And I told my whole long story about the ditch and what it was like down there and how terrible it was and how terrible I was and blah, 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 wah, 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 wah. And he finally said, you know, Lillian, I feel like Jesus can work with all that. To the degree in which you believe that Jesus can work with all of this, that is the hope for the church. I've come to believe that I was taught the story of the Good Samaritan all wrong. I was taught that the goal was to figure out how to be the Good Samaritan and when. The lesson in humility that I got was this. I believe that God is the Good Samaritan. When I was in the ditch, I felt like it was Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who was the Good Samaritan. I believe it is the divine power that is the Good Samaritan that gives us the faith, the courage to take another step, to crawl out of the ditch. And then, just like the Good Samaritan in the story, that divine Good Samaritan takes this broken, bruised human being and places them in the care of another, the person at the inn, and says, friends, take care of each other. When I was a child, I wanted to be the Good Samaritan. When I grew up, I realized God was the Good Samaritan, and we're all in the ditch. But God pulls us out and entrusts us into a stranger's care, because Jesus can work with that. Amen. I invite you, as you are able in body or spirit, to stand and lift your voices for the inserted hymn, Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love.
I invite you into a spirit of prayer to offer up the prayers of the people. And when we get to the Lord's Prayer, if the words that are on your heart are not the words that are printed in the bulletin, then please use the words that are on your heart. But to be in the spirit of prayer, however you speak with a still speaking God, eyes opened, eyes closed, eyes full of tears, hands folded, stretch for God or for neighbor, or on your knees. Holy and gracious one, you give us the stories, you call us into being, you show us the way. Let us be reminded that sometimes we are the ones that need the help. We offer up prayers this morning as we always do for the world leaders, for the countries that are in strife, struggle with war, famine, political unrest. No matter what our political ideologies are, these are your children. They are our brothers and sisters. People of China, Taiwan, and Ukraine, and Russia, Bulgaria, and Benzi County. May those with power hear our words, see our tears, and act justly. We come celebrating anniversaries and family gatherings. The cottages are open, family is invited in. We find ourselves in the car driving a thousand miles to see our beloveds. May your love be present in all of those gatherings through all the family relationships for all the reasons why you gather, anniversaries or funerals, open houses and birthdays. We pray for those that are not with us today, whether they be homebound in a facility incarcerated, or just plain weary from life. For those with broken hearts and broken memories, waiting on test results, And God, we pray for ourselves. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to humbly stand before you, to release the words that are on our hearts, to let go of the drudgery and the anger and the worry May we know that you sit in the ditch with us in all of those places. May we leave this place proudly proclaiming the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for For thine is the kingdom kingdom, and the power power, and the the glory glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. As you prepare to make your offering, I want to thank you for standing in that piece of history that is the Congregational Church, that is one part of the United Church of Christ that was founded in 1957, but your church and the Congregational Church existed long before that. I have seen your beautiful former sanctuary across the way and this beautiful newer building. So when those Congregationalists arrived in this land, in New England in particular, they built not churches, but, you know what I'm gonna say, a meeting house. And they understood that those buildings were not just places of worship on Sunday morning, but that there was no barrier between the life of a person and the worship of God and that the meeting house was constructed to be a place of governance and discussion all week long for the good of the community. And in those early congregational churches in New England, if you visit one that is still standing today, they have no stained glass windows. They were very worried, those early reformers, about any kind of worship of an image, and so they wanted their windows to be clear. And you can see those churches, hundreds of years old today, the theology of the clear windows was this, that the gospel light should be able to shine clearly out into the real world, and the pains and sufferings of the world should always be visible from within the church and the meeting house. Even in your modern architecture, you have remained faithful to that history. The one kind of stained glass window that they were okay with was patterns that often reflected the colors of the nature and landscape around us, which obviously this one does so beautifully and your originally sanctuary. So in that spirit, the early Congregationalists, they wanted no hierarchies, they wanted no body to tell them what to do, no bishops. The only reason they came together was to do together what they could not do alone, which was to address the pains and suffering of the world. And that is how we became, in our own way, a denomination that never wanted to be a denomination, but only is one in order to serve in ways we cannot do alone. So I thank you that in the tradition of the Jewish people in Jesus who gave a percentage of what they had, to the temple and then those congregationalists who gave a percentage of what they had to the meeting house. And then the meeting house shared a percentage of that with other churches in the family to do ministry. And you share of your budget that with the Michigan Conference. And as much as we all could do ministry with those resources, even we in the Michigan Conference take a portion of that and share it with the national setting so that when there is a disaster or a fire or an earthquake, your gifts are already present through that tradition of the meeting house in the name of Christ. Amen. Please stand as you are able that we may dedicate this morning's offertory. I'll get this up so you can hear me. O God, most merciful and gracious, from whom all gifts come, accept these offerings. Remember in your love those who have brought it and those for whom it is given, and so follow it with your blessing that it may promote peace and goodwill among all people and advance your love in the world. Amen. 
Our closing hymn this morning is in the red hymnal number 415, In Christ There Is No East or West. As we prepare to share the sign of the peace of Christ with our neighbors, for those of you that are joining us today, um, we have a song of benediction. This is the day. It is responsive. I'm sorry the words are no longer in the bulletin, but it's an easy tune to catch on. Jump in where you feel comfortable. And as the postlude plays, if you want to sit and continue to worship with the Holy Spirit, then I invite you to sit and continue to worship with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is calling you out into Fellowship Hall to grab a cup of coffee and to start a conversation around some really delicious food that we've been smelling for the last hour, then please join us out in Fellowship Hall. I, enjoy you in, I invite you to turn to your neighbors, north, south, east, and west, and share the sign of the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also so with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Yeah. Hmm? You want to start on that side? Okay, we'll start on that side. Brothers and sisters of Jesus, all of us siblings under God, may we leave this place turning grudges into grace. May we leave this place turning fractures into forgiveness. And may we leave this place turning hardness into hearts broken wide open by God's gracious love today and every day. Amen. Sarah's going to start on the south side this morning. We're small in number, south siders, but we got this. 